Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the holy one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, go through something that's pretty interesting and it's a good place to start uh, the beginning of the year with because most people are, are working with their meditation and thinking, wow, can I be a Sotapanna? Can I get to a Sakadagami in this lifetime? Could I get to Sotapanna even, you know? And we know with our practice, we know that we can go and increase our observation time. And we know that we have the information now that we can learn enough things specifically well enough, internalize them about the, uh, about the five aggregates and the three kinds of feeling and about the how everything is working with dependent origination and how the path works and this is what the training is okay and in the days of the buddha the interesting part of this was that a person could become sotapanna by listening and so what is it that it has to be in that information that you're listening to that's what we are interested in and we feel that the strongest way of helping you to listen and to reach a state where you can uh, release three of the fetters, really understand them completely, is by practicing and by continuing. Very, very clearly. So this, this sutta, uh, 64 in Majima Nikaya, Mahama Lunkya Sutta. The discourse, the greater discourse to Malunkya Putta. <clears throat> so, thus I have heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. And there he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied, the blessed one said this. Bhikkhus, do you remember the five lower fetters as I taught them to you? When this was said, the venerable Malunkya Putta replied, venerable sir, I remember the five lower fetters as taught by the blessed one. But Malagya Puta, in what way do you remember those five lower fetters as taught by me? Venerable sir, I remember identity, identity view is the lower fetter taught by the blessed one. I remember doubt as a lower fetter taught by the blessed one and observances as a lower fetter taught by the blessed one i remember sensual desire as a lower fetter taught by the blessed one and i remember ill will as a lower fetter taught by the blessed one it is in this way venerable sir that i remember the five lower fetters as taught by the Blessed One. Malunkya Puddha, to whom do you remember my having taught these five lower fetters in that way? Would not the wanderers of other sects confute you, challenge you, with the simile of an infant? For a young and tender infant, who is lying prone, does not even have the notion of identity. 
And so how could identity view arise in him? And yet the underlying tendency to identity view lies within him. A young, tender infant lying prone does not even have notion teachings. So a house arise in him. And yet the underlying tendency to doubt infant lying prone does not even have the notion of rules. And so how could adherence to rules and observances arise in him? And yet the underlying tendency to adhere lies within him. A young and tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion and sensual pleasures. So how could sensual design tendency to sensual lust lies within him? A young, tender infant prone does not even have the notion of beings. So how could ill will towards beings arise in him? Yet the underlying tendency to ill will lies within him. Would not the wanderers of other sex confute you with this simile of the infant? Now thereupon the Venerable Ananda said, it is the time, blessed one, it is the time, sublime one, for the blessed one to teach the five lower fetters. Having heard it from the blessed one, the monks will remember it. And then listen, Ananda, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir. The Venerable Ananda replied, and the Blessed One said this. Now here, Ananda, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who has no regard for true men and uns is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, abides with a mind obsessed and enslaved by identity view. And he does not understand, as it actually is, the escape from the arisen identity view. And when that identity view has become habitual and is uneradicated in him, it is a lower fetter. He abides with a mind obsessed and enslaved by doubt, by adherence to rules and observances, and by sensual lust, by ill will, he does not understand as it actually is the escape from a risen ill will, and when that ill will has become habitual and is eradicated in him, it is a lower fetter as long as it is uneradicated. A well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, who has regard for true men, and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, does not abide with a mind obsessed and enslaved by identity view. He understands as it actually is the escape from the arisen identity view and mind tendency. 
that also is abandoned in him. He does not abide with a mind that is obsessed and enslaved by doubt, nor does he by adherence to rules and observances, by sensual lust, by ill will, he understands as it actually is the escape from the arisen ill will and ill will together with the underlying tendency to it is abandoned in him. Now there is a path, Ananda, a way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters that anyone without relying on that path On that way shall know and see. It is not best of heartwood. It is not possible that anyone shall cut out its heartwood without cutting through the bark and the sapwood. So too, there is this path but it is not possible. There is a path, Ananda, there is a way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters that someone by relying on that path, on that way, shall know and see and abandon the five lower fetters. This is possible. Just as when there is a great tree standing possessed of heartwood, it is possible that Someone shall cut out the heartwood by cutting through the bark and the sapwood. So too, there is a path. This is possible. We cannot skip the steps when we're doing that. We have to do it step by step. That's what this is about. Suppose Ananda, the river Ganges, were full of water right now up to the brim so that cows could drink from it. And then a feeble man came thinking, if I swimming across the stream with my arms, I shall get safely across to the further shore of this river Ganges. And yet he would not be able to get safely across. So too in this way, when the Dhamma is being taught to someone for the cessation of personality, in, if his mind does not enter into it, into the quest of this, and acquire confidence, steadiness, and resolution, well, then he can be regarded as like a, a feeble man, and nothing will change in his life. Nothing will change. Suppose Ananda, the river Ganges, were full of water right up to the brim so that cows could drink from it. And then a strong man came thinking by swimming across the stream with my arms, I shall get safely across to the further shore of this river Ganges. And he would be able to get safely across. So too, when the Dhamma is being taught by someone for the cessation of personality, if his mind enters into it, and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution, then he can be regarded as like a strong man. Now, when Ananda, what Ananda, sorry, what Ananda is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. Here, with seclusion from the acquisitions in life, with the abandoning of unwholesome states, with the complete tranquilization of bodily inertia, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, the person enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. 
whatever exists therein of material form or feeling or perception, formations and consciousness. He sees those states as impermanent, clearly, as suffering, as a disease, as a tumor, as a barb, as a calamity, as an affliction, an alien, as disintegrating, as void, as not self as the impersonal nature is what we're going into here. When we talk about self, we talk about not self, we're talking about the, uh, the thing that causes us to crave and cling is getting on the defensive with life, taking everything personally. And so we grab on to everything defensively in all our situations that we, we go through. And this does not help anything but throws us into suffering. He turns his mind away from those states instead and directs it towards the deathless element. And thus, this is the peaceful, this is the sublime, that is the stilling of all formations, the relinquishing of all attachments, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, and Nibbana. If he is steady in that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, because of that desire he has for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. That means anagami. That's what this is referring to. This is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. And again, thought, the monk will enter upon and abide in the second jhana. Then again, with the fading away as well of joy. The monk will enter upon and abide in the fourth jhana, and which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to the growth of equanimity. Whatever exists therein of material form, feeling, perception, formations, or consciousness, he sees those states as impermanent, and he sees them as not self. He turns his mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element. And this is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. Again, with the complete surmounting, of perceptions of form, and this is complete surmounting of and with the disappearance of the perceptions of gross sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, a monk will enter upon and abide in the base of infinite space. Whatever exists therein of feeling, perception, formations, and consciousness, he sees those states as impermanent. He notices the impersonal nature of them. He sees them as not self. He turns his mind away from those states. He directs it towards the deathless element. 
this is the path, the way to to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. For again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, this monk will enter upon and abide in the base of infinite consciousness. And whatever exists therein of feeling, perception, formations, and consciousness, He sees those states as impermanent. They sees, he turns his mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element. And this is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. Again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, a monk enters upon, abides in the base of nothingness. And whatever exists therein of feeling, perception, formations, or consciousness, he sees those states as impermanent, as suffering, and as a disease, as a tumor, as a bar as a calamity, as an affliction, as something alien, as disintegrating, as void, as not self. And he turns his mind away from these states and directs it towards the deathless element thus. This is the peaceful, this is the sublime, and that is the stilling of all formations, relinquishment of all attachments, destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. If he is steady in that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he is not able to attain the destruction of the taints, because of the desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one who is due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes. And then there they will attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. So this is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. And so that's Anagami again speaking there. Venerable sir, if this is the path of the way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters, then how is it that some monks here are said to gain deliverance of mind and some are said to gain deliverance by wisdom? The difference here, Ananda, is in their faculties. That is what I say. That is what the Blessed One said. And the Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted with the Blessed One's words. Let's go back and look at some of the notes on this. When we go back and we uh, go back near the beginning and go through and check out some of the notes, because I had a little bit of fun going back and looking at these notes. So we first go up to 650, which is the first one here, I think. The five lower fetters are so called because they lead to rebirth, that's 49, 649, in the same sphere planes as you are living now. And they are eradicated or they are wiped out in their entirety only by a non-returner. And so the anagami and the arahat are the ones that will not be, absolutely will not be bothered by them anymore. So when you look at these three, when you're talking Sotapan, let's keep going, let's say 650, the question here, 650, let's see where that one is. Um,
53. Having a hard time seeing them, May. Can you see them? Here you go, 52. Here you go, 650. To whom do you remember my having taught the five lower fetters in that way? That's what the Buddhist question is. We look at the notes on 5, uh, 650. The question here is that when the Buddha had, he replied in terms of the fetters, why does the Buddha criticize his reply? And the reason is that the Malukya Putta, he held the view that a person is fettered, they're caught. To be fettered is to be caught, to be caught by the defilements only at times when they assail him. Now this is looking, remember how I said to you once uh, that the, the hindrance is innocent. <laughs> I told you that. And here it's actually talking about the hindrance yet, that the hindrance is innocent. It's got, a, got enough knowledge yet. While at other times he is not fettered by them. Maybe he's letting them go fine. The Buddha spoke as he did to show the error in the view. He was looking at it incorrectly. Let's keep going because it talks a little bit more about what else is being looked at, a little different than he's seeing. So that's 50. And then at 650, yet underlying tendency to identity view now, on the Anasayas uh, or underlying tendencies, we can go back to this other note that's 473. You go back and look at what that one is. This is like um, fun to look at this one this way. Uh, and you look at 473, the three defilements that are called the Anusaya underlying tendencies in the sense that they have not been abandoned in the mental continuum, the mind, they haven't been let go of in the mind, to which they belong. And because they are capable of arising when a suitable cause presents itself, they can pop up. You see, they're in your mind, okay? And in the commentaries, the defilements are distinguished uh, as occurring at three levels. They're broken down. The Anusaya level where they remain in mere latent dispositions in the mind, but they don't come out. And the Parayutana level where they rise up to obsess and enslave the mind. And um, you can look back to in in sutta number five uh, section five of the discourse and read it over to see what that means it's caught it's in the mind but they can rise up and start to catch the mind and then the vita vitika vitikama and uh level where they motivate unwholesome bodily and verbal action so when you get mad you're getting caught in these and they're coming out and the point of the Buddhist criticism is that the fetters, even when they to exist at this level, so long as they have not been uh, uh, fully let go of. First of all, is it practice? The personal aspect is you practice all the time to be aware of them in situations so when you feel something coming up like this you use your six r's you use the six r's and you practice and you let go of it and remember we said how the uh it's important to remember how the um the mind is actually learning because that's what's so supportive about twim we're having you repeat the steps of right effort over and over and over again so that the mind eventually latches on and takes it in and completely understands it so it's not there anymore that's how you eradicate you don't 
eradicate, suffocate, push down, or try and stop personally. That, that's not it, okay? It's a repetitious thing of letting go of something and replacing it with the correct thing instead. And that's what uh, it was making the change in the way the Buddha was teaching. Uh, the others were basically saying, let go of that, come back, continue what you're doing. Okay, but if we come back and try to continue what we're doing without changing anything, we have a hole and then we have a void. What does the uh, universe say? The law of a void is the law of the universe says there can be no, no uh, vacuum. He does not accept a vacuum. So whatever you put there before will come back again and again. So if you're caught by a repetitious hindrance coming up again and again, this could be the problem that you're practicing the first two parts of the, um, the steps of right effort. The first part being to recognize it and let it go. And the second part, um, you know, relax the mind. And then the, the next part is the, the, these two were the purification trained the mind to replace it, the most important part. You may, you're going to need to make a wave at me if the internet goes off so I know, okay? Because <laughs> it's giving me funny signs. <laughs> can you hear me now? Can you? You can hear me? Um, yes, yeah, sister came up. Uh, um, someone suggested if the moving background might be causing the internet, might be suffocating the internet. Actually, what that is is not real. I'm not on the beach as much as I would like. It's a video screen uh, okay. thing. In that kind of, it's, part, it's part of the program. So wow. actually, it's Sunday. And we, we have problems with this sometimes, you know. I can try a different one. Let's see if we can get a stationary one. I, I'm not, I'm not proud. I can move <laughs> quickly. <laughs> Let's see. There's not much to choose from here. Is that, is that better? Is, is it better? Um, we, we can let it go on for a while. Let's try. Wait, let's try. Let's try this. <laughs> is it any better? I don't know. Yeah, this is a, um, not sure if I can change me onto the other computer or not. I'm not sure if I can do that. Um, this could be something to do with a, just one second. Let's see. I'll try something. Um, I don't know what happens if I go on the other computer from this computer. I'm not sure if I can do that. But let me see if there's a still background. We'll give it a color. Let's see if we can give it a color. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. No. That's moving too. I don't like these backgrounds, but I'm stuck with them. <laughs> is that is that better? Is that any better? It, it seems <laughs> okay for now. <laughs> okay, let's see. It's for now I'm the size of a bug. <laughs> size of an ant. Okay. Um, the, uh, so what it's talking about is when, when it gives you the breakdown on those, it's talking about you have different degrees where it happens. And um, so these problems, you know, can be inside without being solved. They don't come to keep practicing. The, the good part about practicing with TWIM is that you are practicing to replace. 
every single time. You are practicing to uh, notice the symptoms of the arising craving or the liking and wanting or disliking and aversion, okay? The symptoms of the craving and you activate the six R's as you feel them come up. But what if they're just inside and they're just hanging out, but they're not coming to the surface they're pointing out that you can you can still if it comes out occasionally you know that's still in there that's not canceled out you see so this is they broke it down to different levels this is kind of like kind of like uh if i was to talk to you like this uh, wait let's go on the screen for just a minute see if i can oops i can't do that anymore i can't I don't have a touch. We went on the screen here and I was showing you that, um, wait a minute, Ugh. this should work. This, is it working? No, wait, uh, it should work. Oh, well, that's, I'm sorry, I'm doing it again. I'm not sure what I can do here. Um, I might not be able to touch my screen. Oh, I see, okay. This is a different way of doing this. Okay. Here. Okay. Do you remember I work? <laughs> I'll try to describe it. We're going to stop this because obviously I have a learning curve to go through with this. Okay. Do you remember I told you guys that you were sitting on a chair and you're looking at your object of meditation? So you're here and you're watching this over here and something comes up over here, you know, in another place, and your mind wants to move over there. Do you remember I showed you that there were different, different degrees that this can happen? A person can begin to feel the pulling sensation and immediately six R. A person could be on their way away from the breath or moving away from the metta and they realize it and then they apply it. Or a person could be all the way over there somewhere and they realize they're not on their object anymore and they do it then. That's what they broke down here. That is why they're saying there's three different degrees of this. This is what they did in the Abhidhamma part of this whole thing, okay? So now here in uh, 654, um, in 654, turn the page and we get over to somewhere. <laughs> Let's see where we go with this. Maybe it's a good idea for me just to, uh, 653, okay. Um, in 653, he talks about the fetter, the underlying tendency um, are in principle not distinct things. Rather, it is a defilement that is called fetter in the sense of it bind, it's binding to you, binding. And an underlying tendency is the sense of being um, unabandoned, like you, you don't abandon it. You just, it's there and it's pushing at you, pushing at you. And then you see in, you go into, uh, um, in 654, the next one, here it said in the sutta, this is at the bottom in section six, it's talking about the three pieces. These are the, first, these are the five fetters. It's pointing to anatta, it's pointing to doubt, in how you're doing your practice. And then it is also pointing your into um, the rituals, following uh, observances and rules and observances is another way of saying rites and rituals. It's the same thing. So the concern the Buddha had about the rites and rituals was basically thinking that 
by following rites and rituals and doing those things, you could get to Nibbana. You would never be able to reach Nibbana and experience it, okay? And then the last two for the five pieces would be lust uh, and green, greed and hatred and ill will is the fifth one, okay? So what happens to you in the Sotapanna level is that you, you recognize anatta for the first time. You don't necessarily have to, you're gonna start looking at things less personally, taking things impersonally, that's exercising anatta and trying to teach your mind that life can be easier if you will step back and use the anatta, the impersonal approach to everything, not jump on the defense immediately, assume that it's all about me and you're saying something to me and then get on the defense. And you know, it's hard to deal with people it's hard to live with people when they're on the defensive all the time. No matter what you say, it's kind of, you can see it in the person. They're just about to say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Even if you say good morning, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Maybe nobody's ever said that to you in the morning in the office before and they say it and you get suspicious like, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> I thought I knew this place, all right? so. That's the kind of thing that's going on there. With the sotapanna, the, the only thing you have to remember is you will start to understand there's another way of looking at things, not taking it so personally, taking it less personally. And that is exercising anatta perspective of looking at things, your view, you see? So you're not immediately assuming everything is aimed at you. So it's much less stress and much less tension in your life that way you actually assume that it must mean something not i remember i i went in a situation many years ago i was invited to sing at a, a, a wedding reception and um there was a very popular person who was this the soprano at this church and i was just the the music instructor but that person was the soprano you know and the daughter asked me to sing the song. And after I finished it, everyone had kind of enjoyed it, but she walked right up to me and said something. And I, it just, I have this gift of letting it just go right over my head. <laughs> I didn't even get it, but people standing around me were really shocked and said to me, well, what do you, what do you, um, how do you feel about what she said to you? <laughs> They're like, I didn't get it. I just really didn't get it. I took it com completely differently than everyone else had taken it and that it just went by. And I think it was like a God-given gift, you know, to be born with this ineptus of not getting, getting it really fast. I don't have a, a really fast sense of humor, but if you were to insult me, probably I would go home and go to sleep and the next morning, the first thing I would think of when I woke up is what I should have said. <laughs> and I did say it, you know, and then I'll think for a minute, I'll say, you know, I'm probably glad I didn't say that, <laughs> I didn't say that. So it's kind of like a protection of being sense, sensed uh, toward the, the impersonal nature of everything instead of the personal nature. You see, that's what this is about. Doubt, doubt is the second one. And what does happen to you when you get on the path and you get to move down a ways down the path, then what is happening is you are able to um, uh, see clearly that this is, this is really an operational meditation, wow. It really is not just something that is a story of meditation we learn at a retreat and then it's over. And we don't carry it into life actively, yeah? And this is the degree, you know, once one person told a story, there was once a man who wants to dig a well. So he went over to one spot and he dug 10 feet. Then he, he got tired and there was no water. So he went to another spot and he dug 10 feet and he went to another spot and he dug 10 feet, but he never stayed long enough 
to dig down to the water table and have the well fill in with water. There was water, it was plenty of water there, but he never stayed long enough to discover the water table in the area where he was digging the well. So he never got water. So this is a really good lesson, a good simile to remember about the well, because you have to, uh, in, and with TWIM, it's especially easy, easy to do because we're giving you a tool and then we are going to send you on your way. And we hope that you will take this tool and use it because we just gave you a tool to use. So what is it that blocks people from using the tool in life? Uh, mainly, <laughs> nobody's ever done that before with meditation in the last 100 or 200 years, maybe longer. It's always been, I go to the meditation center and that's where I have a retreat and that's where I do everything. That's where everything happens. And then after the retreat at the end, I go back into the real world. <laughs> Oh, and they look at it that way. But why can't you take the tools that we've given you and carry them into every relationship and every interaction that you have? That's what I wish for you for this year. That is what I wish for you to find. You see, taking it and using it all the time in all situations, we're just giving you a set of tools. We try to give you the education but we, um, along with the meditation, so that you will understand. And by understanding, you will be able to remember to use the tool more often. That's what that's about, teaching the Dhamma and the meditation at the same time. That, yeah, that's what it's about. Okay, and the, the third one is rites and rituals. And this is how, you know, you can um, be caught in believing that by saying the prayers in the morning, the prayers in the evening and everything, I'm not saying don't do them. Many people love this ritual. I liked it very much to have this routine when I was living in temples in Malaysia, very, very much, you know, and it's important. But I didn't use those services as a way of reaching uh, cessation or experiencing cessation and going further. I didn't do that. You know, I was doing them because they were talking about the pieces of the tools that we're giving you. Now, one thing we did do, you know, we did um, at, at Damasuka, we, we, built, we built this a long time ago. This is a chanting book. And oops, that's good. I don't know why that did that. Okay. This is a chanting book and this is a Damasuka chanting book. So when, when we built this chanting book, what did... Bhante and I, what did we want to put in it? And Kusla was in on this. And, um, you know, Bhante Kusla was there and he helped us to get the Pali and the, we wanted to have the Pali and the English in here. Okay. But we put the things that were most important for you to remember, the things we wanted to, until it knew it by heart. You see, so you were hearing about the five precepts and you were hearing about the refuges and the precepts, knowing what they meant. You were learning the nine, uh, nine qualities of the Buddha and repeating them, but you knew what they meant. You see, this is the thing. And the, ver the, the, uh, the virtues of the Dhamma, you were learning that and comparing it to your meditation, hopefully. The Sanditiko, Akaliko, Eipasiko, Opanaiko, you were, you were looking at that. And that's the part where um, this is visible here and now. Uh, it, it's, easy, it's easy to understand. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, very systematically taught, very clearly stated. Don't deviate from it. That's the message on uh, Sanditiko, uh, Swakato Bhagavata Dhamma. And then it is visible, Sanditiko, Akaliko is immediately effective. So that means also it is untouched by time. It's immediately effective if you follow the instructions. Aipasiko, inviting deeper inspection. Opanaiko, a feeling of onward leading. So if you're practicing the way we're showing you, you will feel a pulling sensation to go deeper and deeper if you're doing it properly that's what happens 
Okay, and then we taught, we gave you the virtues of the Sangha to go over that and the, uh, the making the wish uh, is basically in this way, I can revere the three gems without end while rever revering them. I've received an abundant overflow of merit and the power uh, may, by that power, may any obstacle be destroyed. And if you recite this, this part um, will help you to get through anything. And the Paticca Samuppada, we want you to remember the way it works from the sixth sense doors, right? To contact, to feeling, to craving, to clinging, to the pressure of the uh, bawa, the uh, habitual tendencies, feeling where, how they push up, okay? And the birth of reaction, how it works and how to undo that in the sensation, how to undo it. So these things, all the things we put in here, it's not like normal chanting books. It all had to do, in order to be in our chanting book, it had to be having an effect on the operational uh, part of your meditation. So sometimes you hear a lot of things that are um, different, not quite the same way. So in this, what it's really talking about, you have to read this through a couple of times yourself. And you see what they're talking about is how you come to realize about anatta, how you come to realize the doubt is still there or it's not there, it's gone. And how you examine, personally examine. Rites and rituals help you to realize these things or is it my repetition and my learning that gets me there? That's how that works. So in 655, it's telling, these are the notes, it's saying that what happens here is the passage is showing you the development of the, of the insights that you have are um, in, in uh, balance with the amount of serenity you have. And that's the serenity and insight working together. The using the jhana uh, on which the practice is based as an object of insight contemplation, you're, you're actually working with the um, objects we give you with the Brahma Viharas, the metta, the karuna, mudita, upaka. You're learning to send this loving kindness, develop the metta very strongly. And as you do that, it helps you to go deeper and deeper down through each part. So I think what you need to do is look at some of the notes and take a look and see if you have questions. Does anybody have questions right now? I don't know how to get to the whole screen anymore. I don't see how there's no, nothing. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe this is it. Uh-huh. Gallery. There. I found everybody. Okay. <laughs> Oh, you've got grass too. That's very nice. <laughs> We're just looking around. Little tiny bugs. Do you feel like a little ant, you know? <laughs> okay, does anybody have a question about this? Uh, yeah. uh, there came I have a question. So yeah. um, what this sutta is suggesting, is it a bit like, um, Sister Kema, you mentioned a couple of... Um, uh, lessons ago about sometimes we have the feeling like we're moving two steps forward and then one steps back so it's, it's kind of like you know um, let's say an event happened and then um, you know uh, it, it may not be immediately but you know when we watch how we respond to that event in a um, you know in a different way and then we think that oh okay I, I yeah handle that quite well and then in a different event similar kind of feel we didn't handle it so well then we start to see oh okay and my habitual time so that kind of a feeling of uh, going two steps forward one step back all the time is an indication that uh, yeah I mean is that similar to what this is this, this you're situation? learning you're yeah, it is. You, you know, you're learning to detect and you're learning to sense what's happening each time it operates, some incident operates. And even though you catch it beautifully once, you might make a mistake. Now, one thing 
you know you're advancing. If something happens and you make a mistake and you, you feel it a lot, that afterwards, because that's, you know, 2020 hindsight where we can see perfectly behind us <laughs> after something happens, they call it 2020 hindsight. Okay. Um, and you feel it, you feel this is real. And you, if you, if you push that away and you don't apologize to yourself and forgive yourself, you can go on with this block. You want to be sure that you let go of that, that you apologize to the person. And, and then it falls on the other person if they're willing to accept your apology, if it came you know, pretty quickly and you felt really badly about what happened. And it could have been that you did something. Um, another thing is the same thing can happen. Very similar situations can happen, but they're stimulated by different things, right? Okay, so sometimes the trigger for one, and you, you think it's a lot like the other one, but sometimes the, the, the triggered one and you handle it just fine, okay? But the next time it happens, it happens very quickly. And you see afterwards the relationship to the first one, but the second one happens so quickly you couldn't relate to what I should or not do, you see? And it slips right through very quick because you have to look at how fast this is all happening. It's happening in your brain, lightning speed, you know, whoa, really fast, you see? So you shouldn't kick yourself, um, you know, kind of hard to kick yourself, but most of us can manage to do that. You shouldn't really punish yourself. You shouldn't come down on yourself. You should forgive yourself and then look at it and see, learn from the way it's similar to the other thing. And then you're getting in touch with something. You're getting in touch with a piece of craving that maybe you didn't know was in there. See, now you have a crisscross because you're, you're, you know forgiveness and you've done some forgiveness. So another thing is you can do when it happens that you have one thing and then maybe later in the week, a similar thing. And then later in the week, and you think, what is that? Yeah, that's a kind of message to you. There's a little piece of something in there. Maybe I didn't forgive. Yeah, and I need to, to run forgiveness just to see what would come up. You know, if I forgive myself for behaving that way by for speaking too fast or, one of the things that happens to us is, is this, if we had a bad experience in our life where things didn't go so well in a, in a relationship, even business relationship, and then later on some similar thing happens and we try to respond to that and we don't do a good job and it happens very, very quickly. If we look at it in a book, in a little notebook, if we look at that, we might figure out, we might see how it was very similar to this other thing, you see, but it wasn't that other thing. So what's happened to us is we have not let go enough of our past past, and, and stayed in the present time with what we're doing, concentrating on, you know, paying attention, paying attention to staying in the present time is a really, really good exercise to try to do that and to practice it. This is why. You know, why don't they call it a skill we're learning? They call it a practice. Why? Because we have to keep practicing. <laughs> we have to keep practicing until why? Until what? This brain takes it in. That's what I want you to do. I want you to always pause. I want you to pause. Now, there's a special thing in section, in suit number 61. 61. Let's see if I can find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a special, a special thing in 61, which was a lesson for Rahula. And, you know, we can go over this one next week. Why don't we go over this one next week? You should remind me. And I'm not sure what's going to happen next week. I have to tell you all ahead of time because we're going to be packing up. We're going to be getting in a train on the 4th and going to... Nagpur and then have to go another another hour in the car after 13 hours or something. Um, 
to go to um, to Jetwan Monastery. And when we get there, we don't really know what we're walking into with the internet. They've told us it's been straightened out. We don't know what it means, whether it means we have to set up the green screen, you know, in the office on one place, or we can have it where we're actually staying and I'm staying in a cabin. Can I set it up there? I'm hoping so, but I don't know what I'm walking into. And we have a retreat we have to do from January 6th to January 16th. Then we have four days and we start one from the 20th to the 30th, okay? Now this one from the 20th to the 30th, anybody who wants to come can still try to get in that. I don't, I know that May's not gonna make it from Australia. <laughs> But anybody who wants to come, you know, if they want to come into that, they can still try to get into that um, retreat. Paul's probably not going to make it either, you know, Wales, England, right? <laughs> okay, but that's okay. That's all right. But, but um, this lesson here, if, if I don't, if I don't get to do it, I will try to set something up where you can have fun to give you a talk or something like that. Uh, you know, we can set, set it up so that you can watch a, a talk for that for, for Sunday, okay? We can try to do that, you know, and to get you a talk to listen to. And if he has this one, it would be really nice if he did it, 61. 61 ties into this other sutta because 61 is about reflection and actions, this is what it's about. It's advice to Rahula at Ambalatika, the Ambalatika Rahula Wada Sutta. It's number 61. It looks short, but it's about body, speech, and mind. And it's telling you, trying to teach him at that time, trying to teach him what he should do before he does something, action with his body, action with speech, action with mind and it's laid out pretty clear and learning take a look at it because it's only a few pages okay but it has it has a has a, a kick back you turn back you know piece where you go back and forth from the front of the sutta to the back of the sutta you just replay it for the body then for the speech then for the mind and we'll look at this and this is what may is really ref what you're really talking about in me too is this piece because if we can train ourselves, sort of the old order of think before you speak. <laughs> think before you speak, right? You know, and also think before you act. You think before you move. This is the old, old school. My grandmother saying, think before you run up the steps, fall down and cut your knee. <laughs> I told you to walk up the steps when I was little, you know. And then uh, the other one was you say the wrong thing at the dining room table. Someone might get really angry. Um, they would talk to you about that. And then uh, be careful what you keep in your mind. Be careful what you keep in your mind because of 20, what is it, 20, 19, because of number 19, uh, sutta number 19 in section, um, right, section six, 19, section six, 19.6. Be careful what you, what you think and ponder on, because that will become the inclination of your mind. And what becomes the inclination of your mind flows into what you're speaking in your speech. And what you speak in your speech gives you energy to move, you see? So it's all connected, all connected. I think to do tonight. <laughs> I don't like to pack. I like everybody to leave and go somewhere just leave me alone and I just open up all the suitcases with for the you know <laughs> for the retreat equipment cameras lighting supplies notepads everything and then I try to figure out the workbook for your retreat and get it ready for printing wherever we're going and that seems to work pretty good this is also going to be cold and we have to 
we have to bring extra clothes too. So that's an, an interesting adventure. So, so let's put our hands together. Okay, right now and bring questions with you next time. If we don't hear the questions, keep them tucked away because we'll get back together again for sure, I promise. Okay, here we go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Ding. I packed the bell. <laughs> Bye.